Hello, good afternoon. Uh, or, and happy spring. It barely looks like it, but it is officially spring. Uh, my name is Simona Golden, and I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to the fifth Teaching Works streaming seminar series talk of this academic year focused on the theme, How Does Knowing Content Matter for Disrupting the Persistence of Oppression? This year, we've asked all of our speakers to consider the ways that teachers' content knowledge is critical for the undoing of oppression and racism in our K-12 schools. We've explored together over the, over the course of this year how we can support our beginning teachers to learn content in ways that are intermeshed with the imperative to use teaching to disrupt, to disrupt racism. This theme is undergirded by our argument that no matter their commitments, when teachers do not understand content in nuanced ways, their efforts to intervene on and to disrupt patterns of oppression inside of classrooms is deeply limited. This year's speakers have highlighted two key themes um, as I've reflected across all of the sessions so far. I've seen that one is really the magic and the brilliance that ensues when teachers select and design content and know it in ways that allows them to open up what knowledge is and who gets to make it. Speakers have also highlighted a second theme, and that is the violence that is done when teachers deny access to content and when they obscure or when they erase students' communities and their lived experiences in those communities. At our last session, a panel with Dr. Eve Tuck and Dr. Naila Suad Nasir, Dr. Tuck began her talk by telling us how she remembers, quote, with all her senses, the time a teacher told our class that Native Americans are extinct. She went on to say that this was the first time that she had to spend day in and day out with someone she couldn't trust. Ultimately, she argued, it can't be our lasting goal as educators to be known as liars. And she asked, what content knowledges do teachers need so that they stop lying? Trust and content here intermingle. Trust is fundamental, and when teachers lie about students' lived experience, that trust is irrevocably broken. Dr. Nasir developed the point that content knowledge cannot be separated from how one knows and who knows and who gets to decide. She showed us that teachers can support reframed and expanded racial identities that push back on the racialized storylines that pervade U.S. classrooms and schools. Teacher education, thus, must support teachers to unlearn everyday racism in order to redefine what counts and also what's valued inside of classrooms and inside of schools with children. These patterns related on one hand to empowerment and inspiration and on the other to violence and damage have really been the themes that I see as I think back across the series and our time together this year. Teachers' content knowledge we've seen enables teachers to hear children's ideas or can enable teachers to hear children's ideas to disrupt deficit narratives to recognize children's strengths, to see potential and resources in families and their communities, and to struggle with the canon in some authentic ways. Today, we are so lucky to welcome Dr. Megan Bang, whose talk is entitled Designing for Heterogeneity in Science Learning in the 21st Century. As the distinguished sixth, sixth speaker of this year's series, Dr. Bang will consider the questions we've been considering with each other and with our guests for this entire year. She'll pick up on the threads and conversations we've had with our previous speakers. And as you know, we'll continue our tradition of active and considerable engagement. So we're gonna safeguard some time at the end so that we can be in conversation with each other. So what that means is I'd love to encourage all of you to keep track of your questions and your musings, write them down, um, if you're not here in the room, we really wanna hear your questions and we wanna be in conversation with you as well. You could email us at twseminar at umich.edu. You could also tweet us at the hashtag twseminar and you'll see Deborah and I and other of our colleagues and friends on our phones tweeting madly. So you could tweet us your question or you could post to the Teaching Works Facebook page. <clears throat> 
We'll be live, uh, live tweeting the seminar on Twitter with that same hashtag, which again is TW Seminar. And now Deborah will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Simona. <clears throat> Thank you, Simona. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone, including all of you who are watching online from all over the place. And welcome, 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 Megan. So glad that you're here. It's my honor to have an opportunity to introduce Dr. Megan Bang. Um, Dr. Megan Bang is a professor of the learning sciences and psychology at Northwestern, but for me at least, equivalently as important is that she's also, the, as you can see, the Senior Vice President of the Spencer Foundation, which is the second to the uh, President of the Spencer Foundation. And that um, dynamic duo of Dr. Nasir, whom we heard from two weeks ago, and um, Dr. Bang is, I think, signals something really significant about the directions and things we can look to for the Spencer Foundation in the coming years. It's very exciting. But it's also exciting that you're closer to us at Northwestern University than you were when you were in Seattle. So we're glad that you're closer by. Um, I would say I'm also personally or professionally very excited about having Dr. Bang here because as several of my students know, we've profited so much from your work in, the, in our doctoral courses and in particular one that we've um, scrutinized and thought about often is the one that has as its subtitle supporting the navigation of multiple epistemologies, which I think really challenges our understanding of what it means to think you know, cultural perspectives on the ways in which people make sense of the natural world in this case and how indigenous peoples have ways of doing that, that young people can actually accommodate and think in multiple ways. It's very, very, very useful and I think helps to unsettle, to use other vocabulary, to unsettle ways that we assume. And I think for those of us who think in other fields, the kind of impetus we get from studying that in the particular area of studies of the kind of natural environments and world life forms is really helpful for stimulating our thinking in other fields. So thank you for all of that contribution. I know several of students who have been studying that work are here today and excited to hear. I'll say a little bit more about um, Dr. Bang's work. Another thing that I find very interesting is um, that she uses many different kinds of methods in her work, which I think is inspiring to those of us who are interested in how one chooses the way one approaches one's work with an eye on what you're trying to learn. So her work includes in the portfolio things that are experimental design studies when she's studying things about cognition and development, but she's also sort of, if you think of this as another end of the continuum, I'm not sure I think about it that way, also engages in participatory research in communities and partnership with youth and with communities and with families. Um, she works in both schools and informal settings. So um, Dr. Bang has her eyes on and arms around many settings that permit her to pursue the kinds of questions that she asks and answers. And her writing, I think, has been illuminating, as I mentioned in a particular case, across the things that you've written. So um, it's, it's impressive and stimulating, and I think many of us learn a great deal from both the ways you approach your work and the kinds of things that you help us understand from what you learn. Um, not surprisingly, Dr. Bang has won several awards for this work, including the ARA Early Career Award in Indigenous Education, as well as the Division K, which is Teaching and Teacher Education in AERA Award, and she's published in many different leading journals um, that we've all been reading. She also serves on the board of science education at the National Academy of the Sciences, and she serves on many editorial boards. So, it, you know, she has lots of free time, as you can see, uh, with two jobs and publishing widely and being on boards. And from that, we're um, very grateful that um, it's possible to have you visiting us today. And I would ask that all of you join me in welcoming Dr. Bang to Michigan. Um, I want to just start by introducing myself and acknowledging that we're on um, Three Fires People's territories. Um, I'm from the north of here. Um, but, and I also want to just say thank you for inviting me. This is um, it's kind of a luxury. I've never given a lecture this long before. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to it, and I just want to say thank you for inviting me into the space, and it gave me the opportunity to try to synthesize some ideas that I've been working on for a long time, um, and just haven't put together um, in quite this way. Um, so the title of my talk today is um, Designing for Heterogeneity and Science Learning in the 21st Century. Um, and um, I'm going to start by kind of motivating some big picture things about how I think about science education and where I think we need to go. 
So to me, the, green, the grand challenge of science education is figuring out how we are going to cultivate just, sustainable, and culturally thriving communities. And the ways in which we can talk about science education, I actually think this is true for all education, contributes to this. Um, and doing that in particular ways, given the kinds of challenges that human communities faced in the 21st century. Um, and I want to just highlight some sort of four big picture things um, that I think are um, important and um, frame how I think about these things. So first, um, I think about learning and development as always a cultural process. Um, and I orient to this work to understand that and try to think about that one of the things that we need to do um, is understand cultural variation in kind of understanding human phenomena. Um, I'm sure many, many of you have heard about the weird problem in the social and behavioral sciences, um, and that is simply referring to the fact that our knowledge base is based in Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic nations, also known as outlier populations, also a problem for good science. Okay, so I think about that's where we are in the 21st century, which marks, for all of you who are writing dissertations, lots of work to be done, and lots of possible learning for us to do better around issues of equity and justice, okay? Um, I also think about 21st century challenges that demand our abilities to increase uh, our reasoning around socio-ecological issues um, and systems. And I'm gonna say some things about this, but I just wanna say we've generally not taught about these things in very rigorous ways. We've kind of segregated these out around an idea that this is really hard and more appropriate for experts to do, not children. And I might argue that that's a construction, that's a cultural construction that we have choices to make about that. The other thing I want to highlight is that um, we're increasingly learning that a diversity of perspectives or a heterogeneity of perspectives actually is better for problem solving in all kinds of ways. Um, and it leads to more sustainable problems. It leads to better decisions. And we can think about that at the edges of expertise, right? A collaborative projects are all over the place. The question is, is how do we think about that in the context of student teaching and learning, okay? Um, the way that I think about that, and I'm gonna say some more about that, is that this is um, about uh, fundamentally a need to uphold, um, and I'm referring to indigenous ways of knowing, um, redesign and imagine a new ethical and healthful nature-culture relations. And I'm gonna say more about what that is in a second. So at the core of my work, I kind of think about this fundamental construction around nature-culture relations, and I'm gonna make some claims and then we're gonna quickly focus on the bottom one. So in my work, I think about that nature, constructions of nature-cultural relations ground much, if not all, of human activity, although it's variable over place and time, um, but it shapes not social organization, relations, and decision-making of all kinds. I'm sure everyone can remember the time that they studied how human civilizations happened in fifth grade, right? We start these narratives pretty early. Um, that nature culture relations figure centrally, and I'm gonna use these words and then populate them over time. So if you don't, you're free like, what is ontology? What's axiology? Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be like, ah, I got it. Um, but they figure centrally in kind of knowledge systems. Those are all dimensions of knowledge systems. And I mean that across domains and disciplines, how you know in geology, is different than how you know in chemistry, is different than how we might know in an English classroom or in historical research, right? Those are all different ways of knowing, but I also mean that across communities. Um, and then the last three, which really is the core of what I'm gonna talk about today, sort of two, two, um, that nature culture relations are shaped by um, and impact, impacted by power and historicity. They shape and impact cognition and development, started there. Um, and that learning environments reflect and facilitate specific nature culture relations, whether we're conscious of it or not, okay? So what I'm gonna do today is actually drill into this a little bit um, and both um, hopefully make these things come alive. These are pretty abstract ideas and um, propositions, but hopefully make them come alive in particular kinds of ways. Before I do that, I wanna kind of back up and say, so why heterogeneity? And for me, Figuring out issues of creating learning environments that take up the heterogeneity of human knowing and being kind of identities in the world is one of the critical, what I call axiological innovations of the 21st century. If we don't figure out how to redesign many possibilities such that things like white supremacy 
and um, forms of racism, forms of sexism, forms of um, heteronormativity, all of the kinds of isms and the power, social power constructs that continue to define life um, aren't transformed, I think we're going to be in really rough shape. Okay, so for me, the kinds of reasons that heterogeneity holds the possibility that we might actually transform our social relationships as well as our social cultural relationships, our nature cultural relationships. So I'm building on this and I'm kind of going away from my slides for a second, but I, I wanna, I said some of this already, but I, I really wanna say that heterogeneity is fundamental to equity and justice um, and that being able to see that and grapple with it on multiple levels is kind of the challenge, whether it's in classrooms or in our standards or in our state and national policies or all across our scales, it is fundamentally the thing that I think we're grappling with in different ways. All right, um, so, just wanna make sure. so part of what I'm gonna do today is um, make an additional claim um, and part of the edges of the work that I've been in is thinking about what if not only did we think about heterogeneity as fundamental, what if we decided that we kept and held in front that all teaching and learning is political and ethical? If that was a fundamental lens with which we approach learning, disciplinary learning or not, but that all teaching and learning was political and ethical. And that the design and enacting of learning environments had to always ask what politics and what ethics or whose ethics, okay? Um, and so for me, I come at thinking about the design and enactment of learning environments from an historical lens that I'll say more about in a few minutes. But essentially, we're making decisions, which nicely uh, echoes what I heard in the, from other speakers, um, about what, should, what students should learn, why they should learn it, how they should learn it, where they should learn it, who should teach it, and how teachers should teach it. These are routine decisions that we either make or regenerate every day, okay? And part of why I wanna open this up a little bit is, and this is from Danny Edelson, he talks about the designing is a sequence of decisions made to balance goals and constraints. And sometimes there's a way that these series of decisions become so routinized, we forget to see them as decisions. We don't see them as possible places of innovation, right? The kind of normativity has a weight and a continuity that goes unquestioned. So it's partly why I wanna open this up a little bit. And I wanna be able to think about, and I'm gonna talk about this sort of, come back to this, is that for me, I've been thinking a lot about how can the era of next generation science be the kind of science education that helps change our collective socio-ecological futures? How can we have an era of science education that actually contributes to healthful 21st century communities? Um, I think we're on our way. I don't think we're there yet. So part of what I'm after is thinking about how do we continue to grow the work in needed areas? And today what I'm gonna to propose is that there are three kinds of political and ethical practices in the design of implementation of learning that needs to remain central to our thinking as a kind of touch point in our practice and our dialogues. Not a talk about it once and move on. And those are that we need to continually act and engage in refusing normative power and historicity, that we need to be engaging heterogeneity generatively, um, and that we need to be always cultivating consequential learning, decision-making, and possible futures. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is populate what this means through both a framework that I'm gonna tell you about, about what I think we need to have in mind as we're designing learning, um, and then I'm gonna show a series of vignettes through a case study. Um, I wanna say that the beginning part of this talk is around key theoretical framing ideas towards the design of learning. Um, and I have done this with teachers just to say, and it's partly I think what we need to do is open up the pedagogical reasoning and imagining of educators all the time, okay? Um, and this has been developing over a series of community-based design work that I've been doing since 2004. Um, so you're gonna kind of hear a synthesis of some of these ideas across this work. Um, and then the second part um, will be a case study um, of, a, of a single project, and I'm gonna 
share that case study in two parts. The first part is gonna be around design work, and I'm gonna show you some of the ways that we pull um, heterogeneity into the tools that we use in classroom, in the routine practices that we use in teaching and learning environments. And then the second, I'm gonna drill into sort of looking at um, student sense making and some key and sort of micro teacher practices that we've seen uh, really matter over time, okay? Um, all right, so deep breath, here we go. Um, so I'm also gonna nuance heterogeneity. I'm talking about ontoepistemic heterogeneity, and I'm gonna tell you about what that means, um, but there are kind of four pieces that I think we need to continually think about in teaching and learning. I'm gonna, and I say this because sometimes I get a, that's great, you talked about native people, but I don't work with native people, so this isn't relevant to me. These big principles, I think are relevant to everybody. I'm gonna instantiate them in particular kinds of ways. Um, but so part of your job as listeners right now is to think about how are these relevant? How might I think about these principles in my context, okay? All right, um, so the first thing is, I think we need to be much more explicit about our design politic. Um, and so for me, the way that I think about being explicit around refusing, or a way, refusing normative power and historicity, is being explicit about that I'm after decolonizing and indigenizing education. Um, and I wanna be really clear that I see those as two different things. Um, the first around decolonizing and anti-racist education is that the erasure of indigenous people is an American pastime. We heard Eve told a story I hear. Um, but that is an ongoing problem. There's great work by Sarah Shear that's demonstrated that 85, about 85% of, um, of uh, the 50 states that actually are required to teach about Native people is all pre-1900. That creates societal versions of historicized Indians and stereotypes about what it looks, who is Native, what they look like, what we do, all of those kinds of things. Okay, so I'd like to say that erasure is the modern form of racism around Native folks. Um, Indigenous resurgence is importantly different. And part of why it's indifferent to me is because I'm after the design of learning environments that isn't always in response to colonialism. Okay, part of what that is is that sometimes we set up situations where we're always responding to the negation, and that's not how you raise healthy children. And I wanna start by teaching my five-year-old about the atrocities of settler colonialism. I wanna resource learning environments that helps my five-year-old native child thrive, okay? So those two different things are really important as adults to hold, and they matter in the kinds of decisions we make in teaching and learning, okay? Um, I'm gonna say more about those, um, but one thing um, that I think is really important is that there's an ethic in the kind of thing that I'm articulating. And for me, I'm after cultivating everyday indigenous resurgence and the resourceful struggle for decolonial territory. So those are all sort of theoretical ideas that I'm, I'm happy to talk more about, but one of the things that I think is really important is that often when we talk about these things, we talk about them, not creating the conditions under which new forms of thriving are possible. And actually, indigenous scholars have been talking about this forever. Vine Delora talked about this 30 plus years ago. He said that we've adopted a kind of anthropological perspective in teaching where we teach about native people. We don't create the conditions under which native thinking, native ways of knowing, are enacted in routine kinds of ways. So I'm after learning environments that enable that kind of thriving, not the anthropological teaching about natives, okay? All right, so how? And what does it mean to do this routinely? So for me, um, part of how I first got into this was to understand epistemic actions. And I'm gonna teach you all about this hopefully. Hopefully I'll be a decent teacher about this today. Um, but epistemic actions are the ways we make meaning. They're the kind of micro-interactional, slight moves that we make all the time. This is really drawing heavily on Chuck Goodwin's work, others as well. Um, but they're the kinds of resources or semiotic landscapes that make meaning possible. It's how we resource things, whether how we show up, what's made possible in interaction. Um, and I think a lot about um, how in place, what people have called in place geosemiotics, how the places that we engage in learning shape what's possible or not. So for example, I'm sure some of you have heard me say this, we didn't always learn in boxes where it was only humans and a bunch of art of human made artifacts, right? So we've changed what's possible in learning by learning in places like this. 
Okay, so a lot of what we do, and you'll hear, is that we actually go back outside and think about classrooms as the world, not the buildings. Um, but I also think that one of the things that we pay attention to is how epistemic actions are a kind of curatorial process where teachers shape what kids should pay attention to, what should we know about, okay? Um, and so some key epistemic actions in my work um, have been around these four things, and I'm gonna kind of share them in a minute. There are many of them, by the way. There are many, many epistemic actions. But these four have really mattered um, in, in my unfolding work. Um, so one is around forming relationships. So what are the ways in which people form relationships? It could be with each other, it could be with ideas, it could be with practices, but a forming of a relationship um, is a kind of epistemic action. I started by introducing myself by my name, by my tribe, by my clan, and acknowledging whose territory I'm on. Okay, that for me is a necessary first epistemic action to be able to speak in this room, as an example. Placing, which is a kind of um, making a relation, so it's a, it's a sub-practice of a forming of a relation. Um, but part of what we have studied, and I'm gonna show you this, is that it is often through observation and kind of the spatial placement of belonging for meaning making, where do, where do people locate things? Perspective taking, so taking on of someone else's viewpoint through talk, um, sound, gesture. Um, there are lots of other dimensions we could do. Uh, we could think about that. And then spatial and temporal shifting, which is also a kind of perspective taking. I'm gonna share an example of this. Um, that comes from a study of, um, that we've done, this is a, actually an experimental study with three and four year olds um, that we did both with children and children and adults, but I'm not gonna show you all the results, I can tell you about that later, but I'm gonna use this as a way to help you see what I'm talking about. So um, this is a clip from an adult and a child interacting and playing with this. We were after understanding what, it, what kinds of knowledges were being constructed and how between children and adults here. Which one is it? And Lucy. Lucy. Oh, let's see this one. Oh, that's peculiar. That's going to be seen over here. He's trying to find some fish. It's a fish. You know who else can find some fish? What? Or no, can you see who eats fish in here? Okay, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you and see if you can notice anything you think might be an epistemic action in that interaction. I'm only giving you 30 seconds, so don't be shy. All right, I'm gonna ask us to come back. So one of the things that's really important about epistemic actions and how they shape possibilities is they shape the ground or the initial context of potential response, okay? And then the response, whether it's a kid or an adult, can renew it, can shift it, can change it totally, okay? So what I'm gonna show you is there's a series of perspective taking kinds of things that are happening here. So in this, in this um, interaction, first the parent asks, which one is it? It's Magisi, that is uh, Eagle in Ojibwe. Um, and um, 
then does a, a spatial shift, right? Let's see his talons. Okay, so that's a shift from species down to the um, body part in this moment. Um, and the, the child in this case actually responds and continues to go in that context. Um, and then the parent shifts to a new kind of perspective taking, one I would call the internal, attending to the internal states, says, is the Magisi hungry? It's a new context shaping that asks the child to respond from the perspective of the Magisi. It doesn't say, is the eagle, right? So the, is the Magisi hungry? Asks the child to say, to take the perspective of the eagle and answer from there. And the child does that, holds from the perspective, says he's trying to find some fish. Okay, the parent renews that, or what, what Goodwin and others have called context were confirming some fish. They go on, um, is the parent asking this question, and some fish, you know who else could find some fish? Child says what? Um, and one of the things that I want to point out, there's a, there's a shift in the landscape right there, in the semiotic landscape, that the kid notices. Right? That's different, it's a different kind of thing you're asking me than interpreting the internal state of the Magisi. Um, and the, the parent says, I don't know, let's see who else eats fish in here. Kid picks up the bear, answers non-verbally, adult responds, picks up the next one. Okay? Um, and part of what I want to just talk about is that that's a kind of context confirming. Okay? So when I talk about epistemic actions, this is the scale of thing that I'm talking about. We do this all the time. This is routine in human sense making, okay? And so in, as teachers, we're doing it all the time in the way that we set up tasks in classrooms, in the way that we set up tasks in our homes, in our communities. This is routine in human activity, okay? Um, look, it's like I knew what I was gonna say. This is routine in classroom activity. Um, and what all I wanna add is that the argument is, is that this is the way that culture actually unfolds. Right, Goodwin argues that these epistemic actions are the way that culture is continually brought about in the world, or knowledge systems are continually brought about in the world. They're not abstracted, stagnant kinds of things. They're in the everydayness of how we live and make meaning. Okay? What's important, though, is that epistemic actions are entwined with what are called ontological claims. So ontological claims are kind of foundational assertions about the nature and categories of being and their relations, what is possible to exist, how those existences work, um, and they're shaped by power and historicity. Classrooms make ontological assertions all the time. What's allowable, what's possible, what kids should pay attention to are all things that we, that we decide all the time. In one study that we did, we were after demonstrating that kids are navigating across ontological possibilities between classrooms and community all the time. This was another experimental study where we asked teacher, we asked kids, um, standard kind of cognitive sorting task where we said, what's alive? Give them a bunch of cards, sort it as if your science teacher would say, what your science teacher would say and what your elder would say. And I just want to point out the significant finding that kids know what their science teachers think science teachers think are alive and what being alive means is different than their elders. So part of the reason I say that is that sometimes we forget, even if we want to argue about what is ontologically real, kids are navigating multiple ontological possibilities anyway. So then how we resource these things with language and support kids in doing that navigation is a kind of political and ethical choice. Okay. So sometimes when we start doing these things, we start debating whether it's right or, right or wrong, not from a view of children making sense of the world and learners making sense of the world, okay? And part of what's important about thinking about ontological claims, and I'm borrowing from, uh, um, borrowing from Bakhtin here, is that when we assert an ontological claim, we're making projections, we're setting up the possible landscapes about what kinds of meaning making we could engage in. One of my favorites to point out is that 30 years ago, the things that are at the cutting edge of sciences now was quack science. The idea that plants had communicative capacity, if you look back historically 30 years ago, was absolutely a ridiculous idea. It's all over science and PNAS and cutting edge journals these days. It's the paradigm shift that's happening in the physical sciences. It turns out humans are not the only communicative species on the planet. 
just to say this, 20 years ago when I talked about, we talked about plant relatives in my own communities, people often said, but that's a, that's a misconception you have to fix. Right? When we talked about how in community people had relationships with plants where plants had personhood, communicative capacity, we would get lots of pushback about whether it was helpful for kids to understand that because it would lead to misconceptions in science. My point about this is that the edges of the canon are shifting all the time. And in the same way that we can think about how are we hearing kids' ideas, we also tend to make static the ideas in the canon. We often don't imagine that young people could be making sense of things that the smartest, most expert folks on the planet are also making sense of. Okay? So it's, it's important for us to really hold, and I think that one of the things that we've done collectively is actually deprofessionalize teaching, and I, don't, I think that's a long project in the United States. <laughs> and what I mean by that is to say, I think about teaching as a robust intellectual activity. I often tell my pre-service teachers, heart surgeons and brain surgeons don't have anything on you because you have to do both at the same time. Um, and so when I think about how it is that we learn how to do these things, we also have to have a view. And a lot of the pre-service teachers and in-service teachers, they haven't read any new science in a lot of years, okay? Which makes it hard to do the thing that we talked about in the beginning. Makes it hard to imagine kids' ideas in relationship to the expertise we're trying to develop, especially when many of our teachers went to school and couldn't have imagined this possibility. The other thing that happens here is that our ontological claims shape socio-political possibilities. So I don't know if anyone knows what happened in Ohio recently, but Lake Erie won the same legal rights as people in the United States. To be honest with you, I thought that was way further out politically. It's been happening in the world since the 70s. Did not think the US would get here quite this quickly, and I'm excited to see where it goes. I'm not suggesting it's necessarily right, but this is a different ontological possibility within legal frameworks than we've had before. Okay, and 10 years ago, this was a ridiculous idea in the US. Okay, it's now passed in Toledo. Pretty cool. Um, and so if people don't know about the rights of nature, it's really about trying to say what do we need as a policy framework to move the world to be able to live more sustainably. Okay, so how is it that we move to a possibility that clean water that other species on Earth have a right to exist. Um, this is partly what's going on in these kinds of frameworks. The point here is, is that if we don't think about other species' right to exist, we don't develop social systems that uphold it. Right? That's how we get to mass extinctions. So the last one that I want to say in this framework is around what um, I think about as axiological positionings. What matters and who decides? And so I draw from Jay Lemke's work around um, the fact that in discourse, we are always engaged in axiological positionings, again, at that routine epistemic level. Um, it's determined around the stance towards each other, right? In the, in the kind of um, dialectic positioning of speaker and or the person communi communicating and the person listening to that communication, there is always a positioning happening. And Lemke talks about that part of what we need to do is that in terms of social contestation is to be able to make the deepest grounds of an ideological claim no longer seem routine and necessary. Remember when I talked about that there are ways in which we make all kinds of decisions that are almost invisible to us. It's partly how ideologically closed things continue to perpetuate because we don't even realize we're making them or that we're buying into particular ideologies anymore. Okay, um, so these sorts of things are all ways um, that these things change. Um, but part of what I want to point out is, at least as a native person in the United States, our well-being is not a that Making decisions that are counter to our well-being is an accepted ideological norm. Okay? We continue to see that play out in all kinds of ways. Um, and part of why I'm saying that is because I kind of have you as an audience right now. So as we make decisions where indigenous people are necessary sacrifices, we should probably continue to think about how is that a perpetuation of a particular settler colonial ideology in the US. Okay. Um, all right. 
So part of what I want you to hold in what we're going to now see in classroom context is that I'm suggesting that these three dimensions, epistemic actions, ontolo ontological claims, and axiological positionings are routine and activity. And then if you're interacting with children, you're making decisions about this. Okay? Um, and part of what I'm trying to do here is actually raise your ethical quandaries. Right? Um, if I'm any good at this, you'll be like, oh, right, I can start to see this now differently. I have to think about, am I making decisions? Am I participating in the things that I want to be participating in? Um, and what does it mean to um, perpetuate some of the things that we might care about? Um, and I've just kind of talked about these other three things. I'm going to continue to push these through. Hopefully, what I've also done is shown you how refusing normative power and historicity is tied to what epistemic actions are allowable, what ontological claims are possible, and what axiological positionings have happened historically. Okay? Um, I also um, am trying to get to like, how is it that we think about heterogeneity um, generatively? One of the things that I'll say more about, but um, how it is we see how other people know, or how non-canonical ways of knowing get positioned in classrooms, we can reposition knowledge power paradigms if we aren't careful. Okay, so we're in this space where we've, I, do, I think we've gotten to a good space in the sense that understanding that cultural ways of knowing exist, but we're moving past the making cultural connection. The making cultural connection I see is a continually assimilative move because it recenters Western knowledge as the center of knowing in schools rather than repositioning the power, okay? Um, and the decision-making in possible futures, I haven't said much about yet, okay? So we'll, we'll get there. So what I'm going to do is turn to part two, where I'm talking about this case study. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is actually show these things in kid thinking and in routine interaction with teachers. So the first, um, this, this study comes from what's called Expansive Meaning and Makings in Art Science. It was a project where we were after indigenous science teaching engineering arts and mathematics. Um, and we were really after imagining and teaching around climate change and socio-ecological kinds of change that are happening. So um, it was a participatory work between, um, that was in partnership with the Seattle Urban Native Community, elders, adults, and youth, um, Ready Go Soaring, which is an after-school theater pro uh, program, a series of climate scientists, artists and graduate students. I've been working on this project for going on actually seven years now. So there's been a couple of iterations. Um, and what we were after um, is how can we design for relational auto-epistemologies and cultural practices to shape socio-ecological meaning and making that contributes to cultural thriving. I started here. That big grand challenge is a question I've been after. Um, and then more specifically, what forms of learning pedagogy and relations emerge in such environments that are deliberately doing this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we are in the study timeline. I know this is a lot of detail. Um, we've done a, this is one of those studies where you have too much data for the next 30 years to make sense of. We have done, there's always these layers where we do a series of design work. Um, we do a series of things like pre and post interviews. We also are always doing those um, experimental studies around cognition. Um, and we try to look at kids who participate in these programs over time. Do we see something different um, in their performance on cognitive studies? Um, we have a bajillion layers of data. So I'm going to say we do a series of um, interviews with youth designers and teachers and elders, um, wherein the teachers, the designers are scientists as well. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that, um, but I am going to say that these programs have varied from two weeks, um, two weeks of continuous programming to one week, from about eight in the morning until six at night. They are intergenerational, meaning that they are from kindergarten through 12th grade, that engage, um, and that sometimes we're learning all together, sometimes we're broken up. Um, and um, then we have a bajillion hours of implementation. I'm showing you this so people can ask questions about this, but I want to make clear some of our anal analytical processes, because I'm not going to show you all these things today. But part of why we've designed the way we've designed is really based in um, trying to set up multiple activities and then understand how kids' sense-making um, travels across them. So in classrooms, this isn't a summer program. In classrooms, we have a science time that is 45 minutes if we're lucky in the fourth grade, um, maybe two or three times a week. Okay? 
One of the things that's lovely about doing it this way is we can do science for eight hours a day in various ways and see what happens when we have that kind of density of teaching and learning. And, but we do it with multiple activities and I'll show you more about that. We index all these things as you can imagine. There's a ton of data um, and we kind of look at an index and make sure we know what has happened at every, at every five minutes. Um, we map the kind of um, configurations of activity. Most of these camps are outside for the majority of the time, which means that um, physical kinds of interactions are quite different than they are in classrooms. Um, we do a series of memoing um, around the dimensions that I've already talked about. And then we continually do these microethnographies where we're trying to understand what is happening in interaction. I do this partly because I think one of the things that this helps with is teacher learning over time. That when we look closely about what are teacher moves in moments of generative heterogeneity, how did they do that? Um, we both see things happening that we didn't plan for, and we see the ways the things we plan for either work or don't work. Um, and for me, this has been really powerful in actually bringing this kind of recursively comes back into my teaching with pre-service teachers and, and pre-service leaders. Um, I'm going to skip this. All right. So uh, part of what we've been after is thinking about science education. In the United States, science education has largely been driven by lab-based sciences. Um, and we've been after thinking about, I call it land and water-based science in indigenous contexts. Um, it might look different, and actually I have a project that is not indigenous specific, and we call it field-based sciences. Um, and that's for particular kinds of reasons. But part of what I'm getting after in this is how do we shift from using classrooms as context for learning science to going and study phenomena in the world and understanding where it is that that scientific data comes from. The other thing I'll say is that we know in the expert sciences that many of our large data sets are no longer accurate. So there's all kinds of things at the highest levels to say we need new data. Right? The ecological phenomena that we thought we knew about 10 years ago isn't the same. There's variation happening in different sorts of ways, so we also know that just to project out, we need more field-based scientists, um, broad scale. Okay? The other thing I just want to say about this, though, is um, when we think deeply about indigenous knowledge systems, and I get back to nature culture, this is from Linda Smith, is that the language and the ways that we make space and time real, how it is that we talk about land, matters for those nature culture relations. Field-based science has a way, I think, of resourcing new possibilities for nature culture relations and making it visible in a way that this classroom might make it more abstract, okay? Um, I am gonna say this, you don't need to pay attention to all this, but often I get, but wait, don't kids need to know Western science? In our learning environments, we are deliberate about trying to support kids learning and developing expertise in indigenous knowledge systems as well as Western, but from new power relations, right? That we want kids to be able to navigate between them in generative ways towards healthy communities and 21st century problems. One of the things that sometimes gets set up is antagonistic relationships between knowledge systems that is defined by previous power relations. So we are really deliberate about that. I will say we start from indigenous knowledge systems. Okay? We start there. All right. So how might I really operationalize this? I work with, I help teachers think about this all the time, is one way to really think about indigenous knowledge systems um, is to think about it as relationally driven. Okay? So that, that placing and those relationship making things come out of a view of how are knowledge system, indigenous knowledge systems different. I want to say one really important thing. Indigenous knowledge systems are not all the same. There's really important variation. Okay? And not all of them may function this way. However, I tend to work in urban communities where I'll have 40 kids from 40 different nations. And this has been a useful way to think about and be able to incorporate multiple indigenous knowledge systems. Just like we might say that there are multiple ways of knowing Western science, there are multiple ways of knowing indigenous science and indigenous knowledge systems too. All right, so um, one of the things that we did in ISTEAM um, is that we ended up engaging with three places deeply. Um, one is Discovery Park, which is a community center in Seattle. Um, really cool history about that place, but I'll say more, but we ended up in a, um, it is a former military site it has a water reclamation site on it, and 
It's a really robust site of eelgrass beds, which is a restoration site that's really, really important to healthy ocean systems. Um, went to Carkeek Park, which is the only place in Seattle that has an active salmon run because of the Squamish Nation's efforts to make sure that salmon are still running. And Mima Mounds, which everyone should look up Mima Mounds. There's currently no explanation for why it looks like that, and there's some really good, cool theories. My favorite of which is that some scientists think there are prehistoric prairie dogs that were massive that created these mounds. Okay, so just really fun places that have interesting ecological phenomena happening. Um, Mima Mounds is also a place that is an historic um, and now revitalized Camas Prairie, um, where people go and co uh, collect camas, which is a kind of staple food of the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so it's good to know these places, and as we continue to think about it, um, I just want you to have images of these in your mind. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick view of what are the design specs of iSteam. Um, and I said that we were designing multiple interacting activity systems, but we asked two big framing questions. So one, how are our homelands and waters in the Puget Sound being impacted by climate change and ocean acidification? And what should we do? What are our responsibilities about that? Okay, those are two things that we start with in these learning environments that kindergartners and first graders ask, as well as 12th graders. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of key features of our learning environment so we can kind of get into the space that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, we start every morning with stories and songs. So we start from indigenous knowledge systems um, and we create our first relations there. We do something we call remaking relations. So we work on kind of human supremacy issues and we make sure that kids are forming good relations with plant relatives, with what we call beach relatives, but we focus on more than human others as another level of relations to be making. Um, we do a whole series of deep observations um, and collecting a bunch of data about what's happening in these places and construct explanations. We do the work of harvesting and restoring. Um, so as we learn about what's needed in these places, we actually do some of that work. Um, and then we also learn about what are the challenges and resiliencies going on between the, uh, around the more than human relatives in each of these places. So for example, the salmon um, aren't coming, they don't actually survive um, without human intervention in Seattle rivers. And it's because of the way that we do that urban places have water drainage. So whenever there's a rain, what happens is the fry get flushed down before they're ready because uh, there's too much of a water surge. So the only ways that happen is with human intervention to make sure the fry are big enough before they're released out into the river. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about that kids learn about, participate in, and kind of understand what's happening. We also engage in making, which I'll say more about in a couple minutes, but what I mean by that is we have a series of artistic making. It's driven actually not so much as, sometimes we see art science responses, which I also like, but that's not what we're doing. We've actually engaged in understanding how is it that indigenous communities share knowledge, okay, and distribute knowledge, and it's often through our arts that our deepest knowledges are shared and distributed. And so kids are doing that um, as a way of, of being responsible to sharing what they've learned. Um, and then the last thing that we're doing all the time is we're considering what de decisions and actions can and should be taken. I'm gonna come back to this, but the should we question is a really important one. Um, because what we often don't ask kids to do is deliberate about what should we do. Okay, particularly around climate change. And one of the things that we've learned about that is kids often say recycle. The little three triangle recycle reuse uh, heuristic is really well known. Um, but it's not particularly robust in understanding about what it is that we might do. Turns out kids don't find it very compelling either. That's the only answer. So I'm gonna come back to that should we question, but I wanted to mark that most inquiries don't start with a should we question as framing why we're doing what we're doing. All right, for those of you that care about deep um, understanding of what was the Western scientific content that we were after, we studied tidal habitats, biodiversity, and some of the cutting edge scenarios like eelgrass beds. Um, there's in, West, in Washington State and actually along the East Coast, eelgrass beds are kind of key to healthy um, ocean systems in all kinds of ways and to species survival. We're studying oceans and acidification, so they learn about the chemical processes. Um, we do a lot around understanding what's happening with shellfish and impacts on um, plankton, for example. 
Um, these are also deeply connected to a lot of uh, youth cultural practices and tribal economies in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we explored what tribal communities are doing to respond to climate change and ocean acidification. One thing I should note, we actually were running these programs when starfish wasting disease hit the West Coast. So starfish wasting disease is when we had a massive die-off. It was actually the largest ecological die-off in recorded human history. I don't totally know what that means, but it means that about 85% of starfish died within a two-year period. And starfish are, are, um, are keystone species. They shape how um, tidal pools work. Um, and kids, one summer, saw, tidal, saw starfish everywhere. And within two summers, the same spaces we were in, we found one or two. Okay, so they witnessed an ecological die-off as central to these activities. Again, that changed what it meant to understand ocean acidification because we bear witness to the actual phenomena unfolding. Um, all right, so that's a, a big enough context. What I'm gonna move to is understanding our tool development in relationship to the heterogeneity that I talked about. So part of what we worked on, um, and we had a lot of kind of new teachers in this project, um, is how is it that we might actually design through what heterogeneity means? Not only anticipate it in what kids might bring to the classroom, but how do we design in anticipation of it? So one of the things that we did, you can imagine, I'm sure lots of people have seen sort of species identification cards. You all are, well, so. One of the things about learning, uh, living on the West Coast is I learned how landlocked we are in the Midwest in different sorts of ways. You all may not have been to tidal pools. Tidal pools are these amazing places where the biodiversity is just exploding everywhere. And what you often see people doing is with these sort of million sheets of species identification trying to figure out what is this thing, this slimy thing in front of me or this tiny thing in front of me. Um, and usually they're just the stuff on the left picture with name. Birds have it, plants have it, species identification is a kind of thing in the world all over the place. In many learning environments, um, we start with species identification. Part of what we recognized is that it violated actually some of the epistemological and ontological principles that we were after, okay, the first time we did it. So we shifted this to not only include giant green anemones, but a series of questions that reposition kids as they thought about and formed this relationship with beach relatives. So um, where am I, am I in water, and do I live in a community or alone became a routinized kind of question. Notice we're asking like the dad did for kids to answer from the perspective of the anemone, okay? It's an example, not the only one. We did this through all of our tools. Another example is an observation protocol, which we're gonna see in a couple minutes, um, where we were making observations in the forest ecosystems around um, Carkeek Park, where part of what we did here was deliberately bring together some of what happens in forest studies specifically around understories and overstories. Um, it's part of what forestry does, is they get people to understand what is happening with a tree canopy, and what's happening with the forest understory. Um, but we also did neighbors, imagining me at a different time, right? And so all I'm trying to show you here is that we pulled through the ontological claims and assertions that we're saying are aligned with indigenous knowledge systems. These aren't probably the ways that you mostly see in science classrooms, okay? Um, things like um, perspective taking around spatial and temporal attentional habits, we also worked all the way through, right? So when someone made an observation, we were deliberately setting to say, kids, you should be looking down at the forest floor. You should also be looking at the up um, in the forest canopy, and you should be noticing what's around each of, the, each of these trees. We ended up actually bringing this out to a digital platform, just to say, um, and just, you don't need to pay attention to this, but the point is, is that we continue to pull this through, and there are plenty of digital platforms where you can author in these ways. Sometimes I get, well, we have tools that can't be adapted. I'm not sure that I think that's true. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip this and get to um, showing you this in, um, in actual kid data. So part of what I'm gonna do here is tell you a story about Yuna, Cedar, Salmon, and Hummingbird. And I'm gonna use Yuna as kind of the thread through this case study of what it looks like for kids to experience um, learning in these environments and, how, um, and what we see with different teachers when she's present, okay? 
And then I'm going to do it through th three portraits of activity. The first one is going to focus on ontoepistemic navigation, reasoning about socioecological systems. The second one is around developing axiological possibilities, and I'll talk about what that means. And then I'm going to get to the, what I'm thinking about as axiological innovation. So how is it we th see kids engaged in ethical deliberations and decision making? All right, so first you need to know a little bit about Yuna. So in this data, Yuna is nine. Um, both of Yuna's parents are scientists. One is a professional scientist, the other might, um, has been working in science in a, in a series of different ways. And when we did pre-interviews, Yuna said uh, that science is something that white people do or we do at school. I don't, it's not something that really helps us, I think it actually hurts us. I raise this because sometimes we think and come up with explanations about why kids have these perspectives of science, and Yuna is antithetical to most of those explanations. Right? She has parents who do science all the time, and she still has that message of science. Okay? She also thought about science as these images on the right. Okay? So part of what we were after is, what happens to Yuna when science looks like the things on the, your right? Yeah, I was doing this wrong. Bye. Okay. Um, I should also say Yuna does fine in school. She's not having a terribly hard time in school. Um, but she still is not seeing science as anything that is a part of what she might want to do or a part of that helps her community. Okay. All right. So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, a study um, or a section of our activities where um, kids are learning about plant relatives, forest ecosystems, and climate change. And a typical arc um, for this activity that I'm going to show you a piece of is for kids to first make relations to plant relatives and then, um, and then continue to learn about them in particular ways. We started by modeling as a whole group around western red cedar. They learned traditional stories about red cedar. They formed their own relationship. They learned about the roles of red cedars in ecosystems. They did a series of data collections to understand the health of red cedars in the particular place we were at. They engaged in a series of, um, of uh, uh, making and sharing with cedars. So they did things like making cedar baskets and understanding how to make cordage. Um, and they also learned about the challenges cedar trees face in climate change and what's happening to their populations in the Pacific Northwest. So we did that all together to model what that looks like. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story so that you have enough of a sense of this. So this started with um, what we call Grandmother Cedar Tree. It's a Samish story. Um, and this story um, was gifted to actually many educators. It's actually on the Washington State um, uh, within the tribal curriculum that's open for all teachers to use. Um, one of the things that's important to know is that stories aren't just stories. In indigenous knowledge systems, there actually are theories. There are knowledge frameworks. There are how things work in the world. Um, and so we position stories as not just stories, but actually engage kids in understanding them as frameworks. Um, and in this story, there's a couple, I'm not going to tell it to you, but I am going to tell you that um, in this story, there's a grandmother cedar who protects a young sapling and raises that sapling up through its life course. And the grandmother cedar does that by um, protecting it from the sun, by shielding it from getting too hot or burning up, protects it from heavy rains, she protects her grandson from things like a deer, from nibbling its new growth. Um, she keeps it happy by calling over birds and other, and other uh, relatives to come and spend time with her grandson. And as her grandson gets older and stronger, the grandmother starts to get old and needs help herself. And so the grandson does that for his grandma. He protects her from the sun. He protects her from the winds and rain. He protects her from, from deer trying to eat her. And he keeps her happy and healthy. Okay, so that's the basic premise of the story. Um, and um, what I'm going to show you, um, and you'll see why in a minute, um, is a piece of this arc where after kids had learned how to do these series of activities, we actually had them break up in what we called a plant relative walk in small groups where kids had to become expert about a series of other keystone species and plants and ecosystems. Um, and they had to learn about those plants, their relations and roles, and again, what were they facing because of climate change. Youth were in multi-age groups, um, and they were given a series of tools and scaffolds. Again, I'm going to show you those in a minute. Um, and then they spread out along a trail, and they kind of did a leapfrog. So each group went to each group across. This. I'll show you a, a spatial diagram so you'll be able to see. 
I did want to just show you that this is another way we pull through the kinds of epistemic actions that we want. We created a series of, these are quite different than the identification cards that you might see for plants. This is seasonally organized. We have the shoot seed in here. Um, and we also have these both around seasonal cycles and life cycles. There's an emphasis on relations between kinds or between species on these cards. Um, but the point is this became models of knowledge organization that we used to help kids learn about these things, okay? So what did this activity look like? This is essentially the trail we were on. You can ignore all the numbers. It's actually us keeping track of a particular analysis. But each of the red dots was a group with a particular plant. The gray dots is data we lost. Darn it. Um, and what I'm going to show you um, is an instance of, um, actually it's S6, of interaction between two groups teaching each other. Um, you're going to see a series of crazy cameras. Um, Turns out collecting data outside is really complicated. It's hard to get good audio. It's hard to get good um, video. So we have kids with wearable cameras in all kinds of ways as well as other cams. I just wanted you to know that there's a series of, series of cameras here. All right, so I'm going to ask you, um, we're gonna, I'm going to play this. I'm going to show you some transcript of it, and I'm going to ask you to turn and talk again. Okay? Um, and what we have here is actually the end of the sort of kids teaching about um, Big leaf maple. It's one group teaching another group about big leaf maple. Um, and it's a little ways into that interaction. Okay. So the, um, the, when the leaves of the maple tree die, they fall on the ground and they compost. And that's really good soil for the rest of the plants. And over towards here, there's sprout rings. I'm not really sure of what plant, but there's some little guys who are going to put here. Yes. Right around. Um, um, do you have anyone in the front deck? Are you trying to be sarcastic? No. Um, also, not at the building. They kind of like the grandma cedar tree, they kind of shield the other plant. So why did they grow in such uh, non-straight ways? In split? Um, I believe that's a way that that's kind of, they're trying to help out other plants by um, moving around, um, having their trunks move around, so it will cover more areas. Uh, it could also, also be because they need more sun. Yeah, it's also, yeah, because yeah, really? they need more sun. They spread they out so that they can get more sunlight. And they because take it from leaves. leaves. And so more that trunks, leaves. more leaves. Also, since, more since leaves. they um, shield it off, they, when the leaves drop, it gives some to the leaves. And also, um, that the little trees don't burn up and they also don't drown as much water. But so they die of too much. No. Okay. So, so here is the transcript. What I want you to do is turn and talk, and I have, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to do this. I want you to think about what nature culture relations are student exploring? What forms and functions of language do you notice here? So what's happening in discourse? And are you seeing any autoepistemic heterogeneity in this interaction? Okay. So you might just start with what did you notice? And then how do you get into these other three questions? So I'm going to give you three minutes to do this though. Okay. So you have a, a time. 
All right, I'm going to ask us to come back together. I'm just going to ask for a couple of popcorned out ideas right now, um, just to see. I'm, it's kind of my in the moment formative assessment about whether or not I've helped sh make some things visible. <laughs> okay. Um, what do people notice? What is sticking out to you? For, for other folks, because we're recording and people are online, um, so may not be able to hear the questions. Also do a better job of repeating. So we just heard um, that part, so much of what's happening here is about the relations between plants and why a kind of structure function question is getting answered not only from a photosynthesis, I'm kind of infusing words here, but, it's, but the plant's relationships to other plants. Other things that stuck out to people. I noticed, a, I noticed a couple of things. Um, one is that Yuna really s kind of follows more of the indigenous epistemology where she's talking about the relationships. And she, um, I guess you could say, she gives the plants agency. She talks about how the plants make the choice to care for each other. Um, and then I noticed when watching the video that when Nathan and Renee kind of jump in, she seemed to pull back a little bit. Um, and they're using more Western epistemologies, but she doesn't, give up the floor, she does chime back in and um, add to those. So like when the leaves drop, it gives sunlight. She's, she kind of goes back to the things she was saying and makes some of those connections. So she's kind of um, doing that crosswalk between the two as well. Yeah. So everyone, I think it's an important thing to notice. We saw the two older kids knew the answer to that question from a very Western, in fact, I think, you know, it's a, essentially more leaves equals more photosynthesis equals more food, right? I can see it on a whiteboard in a classroom, <laughs> right? Um, but, but also comes back. I also just want to point out, Renee also comes back to that, right? So they, she sort of inserts it, and then she comes back. Renee's one of the older, also since they shield off, right? So they also, she also picks back up what Yuna had put out there, right? So we might see this as a kind of navigation has some hints of powered relations still, but a different sort of thing. Nine-year-olds and 14-year-olds in intellectual activity together, we'll take, right? And that we'll keep working on these kinds of things. Does anybody else want to share out one, another insight? Because there's other cool data I would like to show you. Anything else that we've missed that people feel like is really important here? I'll say one thing. This is one question by a teacher, right? There's no real worry around classroom management happening in this moment, right? These kids are deeply engaged in what they're doing. And by the way, when I first asked teachers to take kids outside, we get lots of panic about the issue of classroom management. So I just wanted to call that out. We have multi-age groups outside with no walls to keep them contained. Um, and it's just not an issue. We have one question that propels um, interaction here, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip all this detail. Um, actually, I'll say one other thing. Um, it, we might not have noticed, but you know also does the kind of attend to the tree canopy and look down on the ground that we were facilitating. Um, and she literally does that bodily, like she squats down next to the sproutlings, right? So we were seeing some of these attentional habits actually start to manifest in the way kids were showing, using their bodies in these, in these um, interactions. So I want to um, just kind of pop up a level and say, so far what have we talked about is that um, when we take up cutting edge science and socio-scientific phenomena, things that matter, we kind of see different forms of interaction. People often ask me, but I have standards to teach, guarantee you that all of NGSS standards are getting uh, attended to here. Usually what the problem is, is that there's across age levels, right? When we stick to a particular standard and we see interactions like this, 
these are some at the third grade level, some at the fifth grade level, some at the 11th grade level, is that we have a hard time seeing those variations happen, but they're there. Um, so one of the other things that I think is really important that, we, we, that you all pointed out was that we see students utilizing both indigenous and Western approaches, and this is beyond a kind of misconceptions paradigm. One of the things that sometimes I hear is that, yeah, well, Una didn't get that quite right. That's not actually how forest ecosystems work. There's two things I would say about that. She may not have used the Western words, but actually ecologists study these interrelations too, right? That there, it doesn't, and so when we get stuck on like, are they using the right words? We miss the deep ideas that, they're, that, they're, that kids are grappling with. Um, and I draw a lot on actually Deborah's work and, and Rosemary and Beth Warren's work around the interpretive power. When we actually demand particular linguistic performances of ideas, we tend to actually foreclose teachers' interpretive power about what's happening with kids' ideas. Um, and also just to say, right, we usually do things like plant a pumpkin seed. I was a preschool teacher, did it myself. We grew a seed to teach about plant life cycles. The complexity of this as an outdoor laboratory about these things changes what kids learn and how they learn about plant life cycles. Almost all the same stuff we might have done that way, but now with much richer detail and context and meaning. Then I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be growing seeds in classrooms. I'd just like us to do more than that, by the way. I'm not trying to diss that. I just, um, this is a different thing to understand those life cycles in these ways. Um, all right, so I'm gonna move to vignette two. This is um, part of what we did um, as part of this work is we asked all the students to draw ecosystems diagrams. I'm gonna show you Yuna's. Um, so this is Yuna's drawing. One thing that's great is this, this is a systems level representation of changes to land and water. Really reflective of kind of dominant scare nar narratives around climate change. Maybe also true, but nonetheless. Um, and what it says there is before, now, after in a while, and then it's afterwards, and then you get a uh, fiery earth. Um, so part of what we were after is were we helping kids build resiliency about climate change? And we've been calling that radical hope in some ways, and it's kind of beyond a liberal hope towards really what are deep ways of transformative social change. When I first saw this, I was like, oh boy. Not so much disruption happening here. This is what Yuna said. So she says, okay, this is the year before settlers came and everything was really peaceful. This is now. This is in the future. And the teacher asks, what's happening in the future? So wait, okay, so this is, Eunice says, everything's dead, everything is dying. Sarah says, everything is dying. Eunice says, and while the world goes into destruction, then you can see a slow motion of what will happen. Sarah says, wow, that's a pretty sad story you told. Why are you smiling? Eunice says, because, no, no, tell me about it. Do you think, is that really what you think is gonna happen? And Eunice says, yep, if nobody will change, it's probably what is going to happen. Sarah says, do you think that we can change? And Eunice says, yes. Sarah says, yeah, this is just story number one. I want to make another story to see if the next one has possibilities. Ah, so this is one possible future. Uh-huh. And you think we could have other ones? What would it take, you think, to have other ones? And Eunice says, everyone work together to make better places. Unlike this part, we can change that. Everything will be living and healthy. And if we do that, things won't happen. So part of what I'm getting at here is that this is a kid's awareness. It's pretty great if we all smiled in the face of climate change and decided we could change how we live and that would be good. We kind of all need that. Um, but we were still a little bit disappointed and saw this as a little bit flat. Um, and so part of what we did um, is, um, is some redesign. But I want to just recognize what is evidenced here in her, um, in her, in her diagram. So one is, um, Yuna was searching for an elsewhere, a different storyline about um, climate change. Um, and she definitely knows what the storyline is about climate change in the world right now. But it also reflects some political and ethical dimensions. She started her timeline from before, before settlers got here, right? So she's actually constructing this from indigenous time still. Um, and she's after multiplicities. Um, so part of what we got from this in our future design is that we started realizing that kids were doing this all the time, that they were imagining multiple trajectories, but we actually weren't resourcing it particularly well. Okay, we weren't actually talking about it with them. Um, and we weren't giving them much around these decision making. So I'm gonna show you the redesign the year later. 
um, where uh, we really were deliberate about this in particular ways. So um, we were after increasing our own interpretive power. We would realized that we hadn't really seen kids' ethical deliberations or how they were engaging in kind of decision making. So we were much more rigorous and explicit about engagement with social history and power. By the way, after all of this, we realized we hadn't actually, we had an elder who said, it's really great, but you haven't actually told kids how it is that we came to urban territories or why people call us urban Indians. And it was like one of those moments where we were like, oh, we had made all these deep assumptions and we hadn't resourced kids like, thinking about this at all. Um, and it was important because we were teaching them about urban development and why runoff was a big deal, but we hadn't populated the human history. We had only been populating the salmon history or the eelgrass history. Um, and we worked on expanding frameworks around knowledge making and sharing. And so this is partly about the making. We had not yet actually deeply delved into why making and the arts piece was actually about distributions of knowledges. We had been doing that in particular ways, but we weren't specific about that enough. Um, so one of the other things in terms of the deep instructional practices, we were much more careful in our launchings or the beginnings of activities about onto epistemic heterogeneity. We were asking kids more explicitly to say, we want you to think about our, what are the multiple ways you might know about this? What are the multiple ontological possibilities? Um, and we worked on actually teachers recognizing normative storylines and took upon ourselves to actually be the ones to disrupt those things in particular ways. Um, we worked on using information, evidence, and judgments a bit more in decision making, but I'm gonna show you a couple of those things. All right, so this is Tuesday in the theater group. And the theater group was deciding that they were gonna make a play about climate change. And this is Yuna, um, the year later, when they were talking about it, um, what she, how she wanted to tell the story. And she says, I have one more idea. Can we do a before and after? Before we had settlers come and do everything like before where we're doing the salmon bones and not like leaving and stuff? Just to say salmon bones is a story about salmon boy. Spontaneously, we hadn't yet told it this year. It's another story. Um, Jeanette, the teacher, says we sure could. Yuna says, then we could have a sign that says after and, sh and show us grabbing more fish and more fish and more fish and more fish. That's another reference to a story. It's actually the same line that's in a story around people being greedy and overfishing. Um, and then Jeanette says we have two afters. We might have two afters because we could have the after where people were not very respectful and not very understanding. And we could have the after today where, where we're trying to fix some of the time before. I just want to attend to the Jeanette was reframing as you know was going kind of the negative storyline, okay? Um, and I'm just pointing out here that there's all kinds of ways that kind of critical historicity and power is showing up in Yuna's language, how she's still thinking with stories, um, and that she's recognizing there's new forms of decision making, right? That over harvesting is a human decision to be made um, and Jeanette is expanding that. Um, and they go on to say, Chris is another student. It's depending on the choices we made. I have a good idea. You know, said we could try to make it seem like two paths where one of us is standing on the side and they're smiling and looking evil and the other one looks all good and stuff. Um, this was, they were playing off a of Scrooge McDuck kind of thing. Scrooge has to choose which one they want to go to. Laura says, I thought of dialogue for the middle of both one future and then the other future. It would be like saying something at the, about the bad would be first and the good would be second. It would be something about if you made these choices or if you didn't, then this would happen. So I wanna just point out here that now we have groups of kids deliberating about multiple storylines and the kinds of decisions. So what you might wonder is, so what do hummingbirds have to do with this? On the following day, we were visiting um, a restoration site of salmon. There was a beautiful scientist who was teaching us all about what the different forms of restoration. Um, and the kids found a injured baby hummingbird on the ground. There were about 10 kiddos, all mostly elementary, young elementary kids, enamored with this hummingbird, maybe not paying attention about the salmon because they were observing what was happening with the hummingbird. And the scientist walked through the middle of them, stepped on the baby hummingbird, killed it, picked it up, and threw it over their heads. And we had like shrieks, and kids freaked out, and you know, and the scientist was kind of like, it's all right, someone will eat it. It was gonna die anyway, moved on. Well, the kids didn't really move on, let's just say, right? We also had a couple of parents, but it was one of those moments that was like, wow, there was kind of a deep kind of violence that just happened. It was really a bizarre event, but it is what happened. Um, and so we had to figure out what to do. 
actually afterwards. So we went on with the day. We had a bunch of other people to see. But the next morning, um, we knew we had to come back around. And in the morning kind of opening circle, um, one of the teachers ended up talking about this. How is it that we engage in kind of ethical repair? And how did we think about um, navigating what happened between caretaking the salmon. This guy was a caretaker of salmon. We had positioned him as being really important to taking care of salmon people, and yet he behaved like that with the hummingbird. Okay? And so we talked about this as um, he didn't have right relationships with those hummingbirds. Um, and it goes on, we go on to talk about how, um, how sometimes human people make mistakes. And part of what we heard yesterday is Squamish people are trying to help the salmon people again, right? And then that's part of what that hatchery is about, is trying to help the salmon people again. Because the human people long, a long while ago made some bad choices. But they overfished or they hurt the lands. And so human people are always making choices about how we might be good, in good relationships with our plant relatives and our human animal relatives again. What they ended up getting to is that they wanted to make a memorial for the hummingbird. The way to honor what happened was to make a memorial for the hummingbird and write the scientists a letter about why stepping on the hummingbird um, was a big deal. So one of the things we got to is that maybe stepping on the hummingbird was an accident. Maybe he didn't mean to do that part, but he did pick it, pick it up and then chuck it. And so the kids actually got to like what was really problematic, and it was a really deep dive into we all make mistakes, and we might do things that hurt things, but how do we recover from them? And I want to show you what ended up, this ended up looking like in the memorial sections. Ooh. It's still wet. Who made it? I did. Oh, she pushed it. It's on a bed of cedar. I still don't see why he stepped on it and threw it away. Mm hmm And he's just sorry. Oh well. All I want to comment on here is this was, we actually didn't know that this happened. We have so much video going on that we get views into the things that are undesigned all the time. Turns out this was happening all over. The kids were showing each other their memorials um, in all kinds of ways. And we kept seeing this, I don't understand why he did that, in the memorial space. Um, I'm going to show you the next one. The other thing that I just want to comment about that is um, someone else made that memorial and that um, young person came and contributed to it. There was no don't touch it. This is mine, I made this one. Um, we saw lots of this kind of collaborative adding to um, that we just thought was super interesting um, and not always the way we see kids kind of engaging in these things. So um, we go over and we see, um, this is from a section of when um, kids are engaged in making, the clay making, and I'm gonna show you this one clip and then I'm gonna end in a couple of minutes. So I'm gonna go like two or three minutes over, it's fine. Okay. So we're doing this so we can have a bowl. Mm -hmm. So that, because we're not going to leave it here, but Janet will be holding it, and next year when we get together in a circle and we put in sage, we can use this bowl, and we'll always remember the hummingbird. We should carve a hummingbird. We should make a story. A long time ago, there was a man, and he was smart in his own sense, but he was careless. And then one day he was showing these people that came up every year in the summertime. And then when he was when he was showing them how he helped the salmon. They cover it up. We just won't add any more water. That's good. I might give it like a final as it's drying out. Yeah. I'll, with that, I'll just kind of clean up. You see that all the little and sometimes the little things make it actually look more realistic. But um, yeah, but I'll, I'll kind of clear, you know, like any little of the little thing. I'll try to sweep it off. Okay, right? Oh, okay, right? Yes. Yes, yeah, it is. So even did a fingernail over here. Yeah, yeah. 
Awesome. The humming and like the baby was coming work. over his back and I'm mad at him. So awesome. then those people sent him a letter and then they made graves for the hummingbird and then they never Memorial. Memorials. The man took it up by its tail and threw it into the woods like it was trash. What did you learn? You shouldn't step on baby animals. You shouldn't really step on animals. <laughs> you shouldn't step on animals. And, and, animal. animal. and, and this story was called are perfectly fun. The Careless Man. The Careless Man named Brad. You can also tell the story about a hummingbird. And imagine everything that it lived before up until the point yeah. that that happened. And yeah. the story there is more about all the life that the hummingbird had. Right? Okay, so um, in the interest of time, I was going to give you some time to talk, but I'm going to actually just point out a few things. So one of the reasons this becomes really interesting to us is that one, the idea of making the story emerges here as the way to explain this. Also, we were a little shocked about how much exactly everything we said about this situation showed up in the story. So kids are really paying attention to ethical deliberations. Um, but we wanted to just, uh, one of the things that becomes really exciting about this is also seeing kids making that and trying to make story sense of this event um, and figuring out what to do about it, okay? And part of what we thought was really exciting about this is that there's almost a, there's a kind of imitation to a storyline here that shows an expertise of story development that matters. But we also see at the end one of the teachers doing that reframing again. Okay, the reframing to tell that you can tell the story from the hummingbird is that we see that the teacher was attending in this moment that the storyline was about the careless man, which is one way to do it. But in, in a way to think about the memorial, that had been developing, you might tell the story from a different perspective, that re reframing in that moment. And they go on to actually talk about it and debate what the hummingbird's life was like in order to come up with that story, okay? Part of what I'm getting at here is um, that um, this move here, um, it's not, like when we watched this actually, Filberto was, is, was listening the entire time, he waited for a while and then opened up this other possibility, right? It wasn't a, nope, that's not the right story to tell. It was, it was, it let it go, for, he let it go for a while and then he opened up another possibility. Part of what we're getting at is that when we saw this in our redesign in the second year, these kinds of ethical deliberations and story forms were all over the place, okay? And part of what we had not seen, we didn't have enough interpretive power is recognizing how much our small discourses about these things were actually the thing that were structuring how kids were experiencing what was meaningful in the summer. So part of what I want to say is that youth continue to learn in, these, in, in our learning environments about climate change, both indigenous and western perspectives, um, and they continue to build a kind of critical historicity and politics to what was happening, intertwined with restoration, with everyday behavior, and saw the juxtapositions and we could have this kind of restoration endeavor, but your micro interactions demonstrated a different kind of nature culture relation than the one that you were teaching about. Um, and partly they were attending to the ethics, right? They were talking about like how Brian was doing this thing with salmon people and was careless about the hummingbird at the same time. Um, one of the things that we think is really interesting about this as we continue to think about what does it mean to open up heterogeneity is that kids will be asking more and more ethical questions about what it means to navigate and why it is maybe that's an unusual thing to do. Part of what we've learned here is that teachers aren't well practiced at sharing the histories of power and differences in knowledge systems, right? So it's a kind of demand for new adult ways of talking about these things because kiddos get it quick What's harder is actually for grown-ups to figure out how to do it. Um, so what um, I'm going to skip here um, is what I want to end with is saying that part of when I say these three practices around refusing normative power and historicity, there isn't one right way to do this. 
it's a kind of decision and micro interaction all the time if we start recognizing how those things continually play out. Okay? Um, and part, that's good news and bad news. It means that we're probably reifying normative power and historicity all the time, but it means we have a bajillion opportunities daily to do something different. Okay? When I talk about engaging heterogeneity um, generatively, part of what I'm getting at here is that I think that this is decent evidence that we were doing that in that we can see kids engaging in kind of deep ecological sense making and utilizing their stories at the same time towards um, engagement, right? They were interested in science in a different sort of way. Um, and part of what I'm getting at here is this end part around hummingbird um, and possible futures is that we started opening up kids imagining and having authority around ethical issues and deliberations as connected to the deep content knowledge that we were teaching. All right, I wanna end by saying that part of what I think the question becomes as teachers and educators is how should we be making science education um, and the era of NGSS in particular contribute to our changing socio-ecological futures? And if we are not, what kind of political and ethical decision is that? I think I'll end there. Thank you. So I'm going to return this microphone to its stand and invite you to come up here. I hope I'm putting this in correctly. To ask your question, you remember you can also tweet us at hashtag TWSeminar. So think for a moment about all the things that Dr. Bang gave to us. Perhaps talk to the person next to you and then I invite you up um, to ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Hyman Bass. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, a couple of thoughts about it. Uh, I was imagining what, thinking of this as a class, it seemed like much more than a science class. Uh, it was like a course in ethics or, and social studies or civics, and not even a class in ethics, but sort of constructing ethics and kind of negotiating them. Uh, the different kind of moral narratives that happen with the kids. But um, this, I wonder how the image of instruction that you're giving us depends so much on the senses. So the immersion of the kids in nature and uh, access to the things that they have deep sensory intuitions about what does this look like in a math class or when you think about even science and abstract parts of physics, for example. Yeah. How does this image of learning translate into those kinds of environments when things become much more abstract? Yeah. Well, so I'll say a couple of things. I totally agree that um, taking kids outside gives them all kinds of new semiotic resources to make sense of things in different kinds of ways. Um, what I also think is there's all kinds of abstract science that actually we get to in these things, which I may not have shown you very well today, but there are deep, understanding complex ecological systems over to seasonal time and over longer periods of time is a pretty abstract idea. Um, and so I think being able to, we, you can still do that in embodied kinds of experiences in the world. Um, it does take a different kind of seeing over time, for sure. So I want to say that. I'm also not suggesting that, um, one, what people often say, well, this would mean that kids could only learn about their local histories this way or their local places. That's true. I'm not suggesting we should only have field-based science. 
But right now we don't do this at all. And often what people think is like, we can't do this. And now I just take kids outside their classroom doors and utilize their neighborhoods and their, and their, and we're actually working on actually redesigning what the outdoor, what would it mean to have indoor outdoor science classrooms in schools so that you could do this. So my point is, is that I think it's possible to make this routinized in everyday instruction in different sorts of ways. What I will tell you about physics, turns out we've been experimenting with how kids understand the physics of rivers um, so that we can start to learn force and motion differently outside. Turns out you can do that pretty well, actually, too. And the idea of creating representations that understand force and motion based on felt experiences is actually quite interesting. Like, kids can start to feel, wait, there are different kinds of things happening depending upon where I am in the river. It's actually really sophisticated to start to understand that there's things like drag around force and motion um, that we often don't get to, right, when we're only learning about the abstracted idea. But what I want to be clear here, and I didn't show this, we still introduce abstract chemistry, right, um, in these learning environments. We just do it both. We both bring those chemical equations to these learning environments and make sure kids are understanding molecules um, but we also actually go and see it in the world. Um, and so part of what I'm getting at is that I think that part of the challenge here is that how do we instructionally design to do those things um, across learning? So it's not an either or, it's kind of a both and for me. And I agree about the, you know, partly I'm saying the ethics and the pieces here that we ended up doing are deeply interdisciplinary, which I might argue is that actually disciplinary divides are antithetical to 21st century concerns, right? So we go back to like how schools are divided, how it is that we organize learning. There's a deep question about whether it serves 21st century needs. Um, and so I think we can do both of those things. The question is, is understanding what's the right configuration of the kind of abstractions that you're talking about with the deep embodied experiences of these things. And I think, you know, we, I'll just say that we, um, we're always working on those things. And I, I, um, one of the things that we learned is that when we started with the abstraction, kids didn't actually engage in the experiential the same way. And so I'm pretty convinced we shouldn't start with the abstraction, that we should actually grow it um, by deep observation and let, letting kids kind of explore phenomena and start to see patterns for themselves. Um, but I also don't think we should withhold that. So there's a way in which sometimes we set kids up to actually learn everything that Einstein discovered in his, <laughs> right in his lifetime. And so I think figuring out the balance between how is it that kids construct knowledge and how do we resource them with the kinds of expertises that we already know um, and how we do that in ways that don't reify the kind of known expertise that kids experience is a deep question. And I don't know, I, I think that if you took a kid who had been in our programs for five years and then stuck them in a classroom where they did none of these things, I still think they'd be more resilient. So my point is, is that I think there's an evolution to these kinds of practices that will matter as relationships to disciplinary knowledges change, okay? And I, and I think that's complicated. I, hopefully in 20 years we'll have a different conversation and a different worry about these things because we won't be so stuck on sort of the normative power relationships be, between these things and seeing actually doing this sort of instruction as antithetical to getting to the abstractions that we also want to get to. Yeah. Hi, Megan. Hi. Uh, my name is Macy. I'm assistant professor here. Thank you so much for your talk. And there's lots of future teachers in the room, so I'm really happy to see all of you here. Um, I think my question is around um, the social identities of the students that are there um, and thinking about what difference that makes. And for non-native students, especially how they might take to these onto epistemic the heterogeneity is that connected to again a history and a set of relationships that other students might that are non-native might not have access to and what does that mean about their possibilities of thinking in this really dynamic way yeah so one all of the people you saw in these videos are native they're multiracial but they're all native um, and two um, part of what I want to say about that is it's super interesting for us to see how people, how kids' identity shifts change over the week. Um, and we've actually been working, I have a student who's actually working on this. Um, we see lots of what I might call settler colonial directions of identity where we're asking things like blood quantum or you don't look native, 
you look black or you look white, um, happening at the beginning of these, um, of these programs, totally gone by the end in these super interesting ways, right? Part of what we got called on though was to say we had to give them explicit identity resources and name those as problems so that kids could make choices about the identity narratives that they were both taking as given and projecting on others. But we literally had a question, we had some seven and eight year olds who were identifying themselves by their blood quantum um, and no one had ever explained to them about where blood quantum came from, right? Or no one had ever explained to them that there's a difference between indigenous identity and racial identity, right? And that what it meant to be a citizen of a nation, a descendant of a nation, and how we might actually think about indigeneity more globally too. So the other thing I'll say is that um, in Washington State, there are increasingly um, indigenous folks from Central America that do not ever speak Spanish. They only speak their indigenous language. Um, that are a part of these programs. And part of what that actually did very quickly is recognize how um, Latinx folks are racialized in particular ways and their indigeneity is erased by the way that racial category gets constructed. Um, and so we started being really deliberate about actually resourcing kids with that critical lens. And it's super interesting to think about like how quickly they were like, oh yeah, that makes no sense. We're not treating each other like that anymore. And we actually saw each other, the kids starting to hold each other up around how they were hurting each other's own identities. Um, so one of the things I think is, we, I didn't talk about this at all, but kids are ethically deliberating about their own identities too, right? Um, in ways that once we open up and resource the language explicitly, I will say it was a huge lift for us. The other one that we did last summer that we had not done before um, is that we had two kids um, come out um, and then we um, had a trans kid who had been in the program since um, she was very young. And actually it was only me and another teacher who knew she was trans. Everyone else just knew her. Um, and, but she, she wanted to come out as trans. Um, and so we hadn't resourced gender identity language or sexuality identity at all. But they raised it. And we actually, saw, we also boggled it a little bit, I should say that. Like, and part of what happened is we realized that no one had resourced kid language, so what we heard from seven-year-olds was really problematic language about both of those things. We had 12-year-olds that kind of were like, I don't know what to do with this. And we had 14 and 50-year-olds that were really excited but also angsty about it, right? Um, and, and so, you know, we're actually in the middle of deep redesign about that and are figuring that out a little bit. But the point is, is that I actually think that one of the things that we do is that we're so worried about getting it right that we actually foreclose even the possibility of it. Um, and so for, for us, that's been a continual demand. Um, and we're following the kids about this. Um, I cannot, it was, it, <laughs> that our teachers, and myself included, um, struggled more than the kids did about opening up this space. Um, but I do think, right, like kids able to talk about these things in not the way that adults talk about these things is entirely possible. People were not virally angry with each other, right? These were kids trying to learn about these things in a different sort of way when we made it possible. Um, and we helped them understand the histories of the problematic identities they were bringing to the space. You've all heard me having to come up and say goodnight before, and you know that I hate this. It's the one part of all of this that I really don't like one bit, um, other than the part where I get to say thank you so much for um, just animating us with these conversations and these considerations, and I'm quite sure we will all be having um, deep deliberations for quite a long time about the things that we just learned from you. Um, as we sense make with each other and um, so I am I am so grateful and I know that my colleagues are also so deeply grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you.